I'm living a dream, sir. How are you? I'm well. John, are you well? I'm well. Bill? Oh, definitely so. I think we're all well. It's a perfect day then, guys. Everybody's (laughs) happy and healthy. Of course it is early. Colin, shut off the lights. Let's just go home now. We've peaked. Turn it off. At 8.38 a.m., we've peaked. Phil, uh, this is NFL Draft Week. This Thursday, the NFL Draft gets underway, and everybody uh, thinks Bryce Howard's going to be the first pick of the draft, quarterback out of Alabama. Harper. Isn't Bryce Young, yes. Uh, Bryce Young. What a, yeah, Bryce yeah, Howard's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Him Bryce going Young. first, then there's some debate about C.J. Stroud, whether he'll go second or not, but... Yeah, I get excited for the draft, and then shortly after realize it really doesn't mean all that much for the upcoming season. But I do get excited for it because I haven't had NFL for a while. And then, you know, more excited to see where, if and where any of these Shepherd guys land. That's I'm fired up for that. But that I guess they would go on more than likely Friday, Saturday toward the end. But but really excited, hopeful that uh, that some of these guys get get drafted. That'd be great. Think about how the NFL has changed over the years when you have a guy like. Bryce Young, who's 5'10 something and would, is, is widely considered to be the top pick in the draft as a quarterback. Remember when Doug Flutie at 5'9 tried to play in the NFL and he had to go to Canada first for like 10 years to prove himself? And then he just got knocked around the NFL a few years and then was out. And he was just too short at 5'9. And now you've got several under six feet quarterbacks in the league who are succeeding and doing well because the game has changed tremendously. Yeah, the game's changed a lot. You can't hit the quarterbacks like you used to be able to hit the quarterbacks. Uh, even though I'm an all, old offensive lineman, I wish, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like some of the rules with the quarterbacks. And you know, just basically hands off. I don't even know why they wear pads and helmets. But I agree. The, uh, I'm a flag. You know, with with but with Doug Flutie or not Doug Flutie, but Drew Brees uh, having such success with his size, and then Russell Wilson. I guess you know, with the change of the game, and they're starting to look at these smaller guys and saying, hey, why not? Um, I, I would still be a little bit fearful of someone the size of I mean, anything but a scout, but the size of Bryce Young. Because, man, I mean, he's 180 pounds soaking wet. I mean, I know they listed him at 200 pounds, but then he refused to weigh in at the combine. There was a reason for that. And you look at the size and speed of some of these guys, and if he does get outside of that pocket and get hit, man, it, it's hard to tell uh, what would happen to that poor guy's body. But uh, it, it does appear anyway that he'll be the the first pick in the draft. I like a more traditional, bigger guy, you know, like maybe a, a Bajan, 6'3", 220. Uh, boys rocked up, you know, he's ready to go. And, you know, I like that size. But I'm an old Steeler guy, right? But uh, but it's exciting, though. I like watching this stuff and, and trying to anticipate – what our Pittsburgh Steelers would do and, you know, if and where these guys from Shepard would get drafted. Shepard has three guys that could get a look at the NFL. And you got Joey Fisher on the line, Ronnie Brown in the backfield, and, of course, the aforementioned Tyson Bajant at quarterback. And people have been talking about Bajant a lot, but I know you think that uh, Joey Fisher should get more attention there. I do, and you know, if you look at, first of all, each team carries eight, nine, ten offensive linemen. While the quarterbacks will keep two, possibly three, on the active roster, so there's there's more to be had, and there's more positions. So if you say, "Hey, look, this this guy's not nimble enough to be a tackle, uh, or or big enough to be a guard or a center," and and a lot of them are interchangeable. You know, you could it, just because you think of an offensive lineman, like, "Oh, he's a tackle." No, he's an offensive lineman, and those guys pretty much, by and large, can play anywhere across the ball. So that I think there's more opportunities for Fisher. And even though he didn't get a invite to the scouting combine, the numbers he put up, and you know, and a lot of people roll their eyes at some of these strength numbers and the power numbers that they display, but it does mean something, right? It's better than him not being able to bench 225 at all or getting it four or five times. So they do mean something. They have validity. And that kid is, a, I mean, he's a house, man. And every time you saw him play, I don't care what the competition was, and being an old offensive lineman, you know, like I, I recognized the push that he got off the line and the bodies that were laying around when he played, and and so I'm I'm really I mean, it, you know, I, I hope all of them get drafted, but you know, in, internally as an old offensive lineman at Shepherd, I really hope that guy gets a shot because he he's he's a beast. He's got an interesting story himself, you know, he's got the, quite the story himself where he kind of worked with his dad for a little while and. And then eventually ended up at Shepherd. So he didn't have the smoothest of roads 
uh, to where he's at either. That that's newsworthy as well. He he had to endure some ups and downs. So I'm excited for these guys. Bill, I know you're chomping over there. I heard a bunch of noise by your microphone. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Hey, uh, uh, Phil, uh, I, I get confused. I remain confused about the evaluation process, and we hear frequently that individuals from small schools, Division two schools, are at a disadvantage because of the, the lack of experience. Uh, or in a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of years ago uh, Haskins, even though he was gra- uh, drafted in the first round, uh, he was criticized of having played only uh, – uh, half of a full year at Ohio State, maybe two thirds. But anyway, was was criticized for not lack of experience. But yet, you have the NFL Combine. You put them in all sorts of trying uh, circumstances. Uh, and certainly someone like uh, Bajan uh, with his physical skills and his passing skills uh, probably ranks very, very high. Give me a clue on the balance between this experience factor and the physical attributes that you see in a combine? I think a lot of it's position specific, though, because if you look at, you know, experience would come in more to play with a quarterback than it would, uh, say, a linebacker. You know, they want to see a quarterback that has seen the speed of the game and and can react and then go through full seasons. Because, I mean, it's a trek, man. Even that she – I talk about my playing days at Shepard. That was a long, long time ago. But it was hard. It was tough to balance, you know, week to week and deal with the injuries and and pivot from one week you're playing this team to the very next day you're that's behind you and you're studying for the next and have the discipline to, to eat right and get enough sleep. And, you know, that discipline was thrust upon us by one Pete Yurish. She made sure that we did all those things or we would be punished for it severely in some cases. But – but it, it's all of those all those attributes. Now, as far as the combine goes, I think that may be just confirmation that this kid has the physical skills. I don't know that you know. It used to they used to really pay a lot of attention to the combine, and then they started to some extent anyway started to dismiss it some and say, hey, they're playing in pajamas, which is which is accurate. You know, you can look at a, a linebacker, offensive lineman, or whatever, and just because they run. A four eight instead of a four six. Does that really mean that they're a better football player? So they do tend to rely on and look at the film more so than the combine, and use the combine as kind of a confirmation as what we saw on film. And you know, I hear a lot of talk about this. And what kind of shape have they kept themselves in in the interim from the end of the season until now? What kind of cardiovascular shape are in? It's not as if they can't get them in shape. But we have to rely on these people to be grown men. And I hear them talking about there's one offensive lineman that everybody, I forget his name, that everybody loves. And over the weekend as I'm doing chores and yard work around the house, I'm listening to this draft coverage. And everybody has fallen off on him because he wasn't in good enough cardiovascular shape to finish some of the drills at the pro day. And they know that he's the best physically. But as far as his, his physical condition, he put on a bunch of weight. He was extremely tired. He couldn't get through some of the stuff. And you're thinking, like, and I'm going to pay him millions of bucks. I'm going to use a first or second round draft pick on this guy, and he can't even get ready for the to this point the most important job interview he's ever had. So I think in some cases they just kind of use that as confirmation. It may not bolster where they pick them or where where they think of them on the draft board, but just confirm what they already think. You know, we do even at the high school level. You do combine sort of things at the high school level to figure some stuff out on on players and athletes and i think mike tomlin the coach of the steelers just calls that stuff football in shorts you know when you yep. get together for, pajamas and, and even at the high school level there there are kids and and uh this is a label that i've kind of given to the lacrosse kids who who every once in a while come out in the spring to play wide receiver because all the lacrosse kids can run and they all look great i'm not talking about kids that grew up playing football and lacrosse i'm talking about kids that just played lacrosse uh, coming up and they're trying football for the first time and they look great in the spring when we do football in shorts and in the seven on seven summer leagues and then August when we put the pads on and it's a totally different situation and scenario and and most of those kids and I'm not picking on lacrosse players I'm just using as an example here from what I've seen with my own eyes most of those kids who grade out really well with all the athlete stuff once the pads come on tend to not be there. 
It, yeah, it's, yeah the, and that was, you know, the football players, the guy you say that runs a 4-8 fill instead of the 4-6, but makes tackles on film, uh, those guys yeah. get drafted in the middle rounds or signed as unrestricted free agents, and they usually make the team as a, as a special teamer for the first year or two. But there's just some people who are football players, you know, in any yep, sport. Same, they're better you know. football players. And it was always the case, even in my days at Shepherd, the guys that were at the top of the leaderboard, we kept track of all that and competed, and we thought it was fun. But the strongest and the fastest and the quickest and the one that jumps the highest, they were never the better players. They were always the play, the kind of the role players. They're good guys, and they worked hard, but they weren't the best football players. And that was always the case. You rarely saw, like, hey, our best lineman – has the biggest squat. No, no, it was a guy that barely ever saw the field. And, uh, you know, the fastest guy was their best receiver. No, 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 that guy barely, he, he, he barely ever uh, saw the field. He was on kickoff return maybe. And, but that was always the case. You know, the, the meat of our team was right in the middle of that pack. You know, they, they, they were all around strong and quick and fast, but they weren't the, the strongest and the fastest. Let's talk money. Phil, Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ futures are slightly lower this morning, around a tenth of a percent or so to the downside. What are we waiting for this morning? I know earnings are big. Coca-Cola reported earlier this morning, and they beat estimates. Uh, it's going to be the same narrative as last week. And, again, I welcome it, even though last week – we broke us a winning streak. I think it was a four weeks we broke that, and it wasn't terrible, but we were paying attention to earnings. Let's watch the earnings. Let's see actually how these companies had performed, and we reacted off of that. I think by and large, and some of that good news is bad news narrative and everything is pushed toward the Federal Reserve, that's still there, but it's not as strong as what it was before because now – our assumption is that there's going to be one more rate increase in early May of a quarter of a percent, and then moving forward will be data-driven, but it wouldn't be anything drastic like we saw last year. So we're starting to absorb that and look through that to see what is next, and that's where now the debate is. Is what's next a hard-landing, long-standing recession is it a short recession or is it no recession at all? And if you were to ask 100 people, you'd probably be split amongst the three. We're going to have a very long, painful re- recession would be a third of them. And then another third, and it's probably where I land, it would be, it's going to be a short, short recession. And then there's another third that says, nope, no recession at all because look at these indicators. So that's the debate now. But we are paying attention to company earnings, and this week is huge with Microsoft and Amazon, Google and Facebook, some of those FANG stocks we used to talk about so very much back during the COVID days they're reporting this week. And these are the ones that's had the job layoffs. So let's see what's what's their earnings look like and how much money did they make. And then this morning we spoke about Caterpillar. That's a, some good insight to what our manufacturing looks like and consumer confidence numbers that come out those days. So there is a lot of information that comes out this week, but it does feel kind of normal opposed to what the last, I don't know, 10 months has been like. It feels more normal where we can pay attention more so to how companies are actually doing opposed to every single thing that happens. How's Jerome Powell going to read this and what are they going to do with rates? That's still there, and there's always a component to that. That's still there, but I think it's pretty solidly expected regardless of what earnings are and what the GDP number is. I think it comes out on Thursday. That's expected to be 2.2 regardless of what that consumer confidence is at that quarter of a percent coming in early May and then probably a pause, and then we'll assess from there whether we just hold rates steady as they are, start to cut or increase again. That will be data-driven. The Wall Street Journal has had a couple articles in the few in the last few weeks about um, family credit card debt is on the rise, and uh, also very. I, I don't know if this is surprising or not, or what the impact would be. But there's only 52 percent of American adults have life insurance now, as opposed to 63 percent in in 2011. Is this an indicator of people cutting back on on? spending that used to be usual and running up credit card debt because you know, is this a harbinger of bad things i don't i'd like to read that article because that sounds extremely interesting and i don't i wouldn't know and that that landing right in the field of what we do with financial planning with the life insurance and, and you know with our clients our clients aren't the norm you know if you have a financial planner you're probably not 
the typical consumer that does typical things, you're more likely to save and and invest and save for the future and, and be prudent when it comes to life insurance. But that's something that I hadn't heard before. That's a very, very interesting stat about the life insurance, because that is something I hadn't heard before. The credit card debt, I think, is cyclical, and it goes along with, look, we're paying more for everything, right? So, And even though wage inflation is part of this inflation narrative, they haven't kept up with uh, the overall inflation rate. So, therefore, you know, we burnt through the savings that we had had through COVID. That was something we kept an eye on. We burnt through those, and now we're to the point, instead of spending savings, we're using our credit cards and pent-up demand. We still have to remember that. You know, there's still some of that remnants left over where we couldn't do these things like we used to back in 2020, and then when we we hit the hit the ground running when we were able to, and there's still some of that left over. You know, even on the street when you talk to people, it's like, well, we didn't go on vacation in 2020, and then we still didn't go in 2021 because we were we didn't know what would be open or what we could do. So, and now we're you know we're doubling up in 2022 and in 2023. There's still some of that left over, and and I read this and I, and I didn't read it. Uh, I didn't pay enough attention to quote it. But they were talking about banked time off that people had received because of not traveling in 20 and 21, even if they were working from home, but that didn't count as time off, and they couldn't travel, so they had more time to use. And therefore, the travel industry had kind of profited from that because we have more time to burn through now that because we saved it up through 20 and 21. But I had not heard that about the life insurance, and that is an alarming stat because if you have people financially dependent upon you and you have debts or things that you may leave for them if you were to pass, especially if you have children, of course, that's extremely important. I'd like to dig into that number and say, hey, what goes beyond this? Are we having less kids now? Or, or are our children growing up, or you know, what, what's that look like? Is the baby boomers is that part of that? Because their kids are gone now, and those terms have expired. There's a lot that can go into that. I'd like to look that up. I may ask you to send me that link. That would right. be something really interesting. It was last Sunday or Monday, um, Wall Street Journal a week ago. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Okay. Financial Phil, our guest here on the program. Phil, do you know that you're in a recession? We were in one, or do you have to wait until after when the report says we were in a recession from <laughs> September to December of 2023? Well, some people know or they speculate that we're in a recession. And we have to remember, you know, this whole atom, uh, uh, anatomy of a recession idea, this is a group of people that says, okay, now we're in a recession and this is when it began. So you could, you know, to me, you know, if you look at economic indicators, it doesn't say that we're in a recession. But they could, uh, once they declare a recession, go back and say, okay, this is when it started. And so, no, not really. You don't really know, but a lot of people think that we're in a recession right now. Um, that's a widely held belief, by the way, not just, you know, we're, not, we're talking about the thirds uh, of those 66% that would think that we're going to go into a recession. It's just a debate whether how long that would last of those 66 percent most of them do think that we are currently in a recession and once it's declared it will encompass the time frame that we're in right now you don't really know but you can speculate and it depends on the sector that you're you know that you're focusing on you know some say that we're in a rolling recession where one sector or one area would struggle for some time and then recover and then the next sector or area would struggle and, and therefore be a rolling recession, which would also mean that maybe we don't go into a widespread recession at all. That's what the, that last third that says, hey, we're, not, we're going to have a soft landing and not go into a recession. We're going to have a rolling recession that wouldn't impact the overall economy to the extent that they could call recession. That's a good question, though. But the, uh, the, the answer is no, you can speculate, but you don't really know it until they declare it. That kind of leads to the question I was going to ask, Phil. We've been hearing for the last, at least the last two years, uh, we're going to go into recession. It's kind of the the rolling comment that we, we hear it, and then six months down the line, we hear it again, then six months to keep hearing it. So what you're saying is that perhaps these fears that we had two years ago have at least in part uh, come to fruition. They have, and, and that come to fruition, but only one sector or area at a time. 
so not all at once, which is referred to as a, as we would refer to anyway as a rolling recession. So it just happens in, in pieces. But our, you're you're right. We have been talking about this for quite some time and predicting it for quite some time. But our economy has proved out to be much more resilient and strong than what we would have imagined through all these rate increases where our consumers just keep pounding through and running up that credit card debt. We don't like that from a financial planner standpoint at all. And, you know, if you heard someone say, hey, we're running up our credit cards. But on the overall picture of the economy, that means people are still spending money, and that supports inflation. That's an inflationary pressure because we seem to spend it and don't really care. We'll complain about the cost of goods and services and gas and travel and all these things that we're doing, but we still buy them. Phil, would that imply that over the last couple of so years the Fed has been right more than it's been wrong? I don't know, man. I seem to be, and, and me and Rob get going on this all the time, I, I tend to give the Federal Reserve a, a break for what they have done through COVID, and some don't. Some just blow them up. You guys waited too long to start increasing rates. Therefore, we had these huge increases all at once. So it's clear that they were wrong uh, earlier on by not increasing rates at the first signs of inflation because they could have slowed that and it would have never gotten as bad as it was. But in their defense, they were wrong because they were dealing with something we had never dealt with before. And the second coming of COVID with the Delta variant and then the third coming of COVID with Omicron, that slowed them down some. And then even Russia invading Ukraine slowed them down a bit. So you had all these narratives that went into, well, we need to raise rates, but how can we raise rates in the, in the face of this? But their very first thought was inflation was transitory. Remember that term? It's, in, it's transitory. It won't last because of how we compare it. And it made sense to me, but they were wrong. And they've admitted that they were wrong from that standpoint about it being transitory. But they, they have been wrong and admitted it. But I seem to, I tend to give them a pass more so than anyone else because I know what they were looking at and how can you – you had nothing to go back and, and reference. There was nothing to go back and reference because of what caused all this inflation was something that was new to us. Well, at some point along the way, if you say we're going to be in a recession long enough, you'll eventually be right because there's always going to be a recession exactly. at some point you'll in the future. you'll be right eventually. Yes, but yes, uh, but it, it may have some traction this time around, Phil, in the sense that – Prices are still very high. You go to the supermarket, you know, you, you look at the basket and you go, how does that equal that? Uh, I bought something for $8 yesterday that was $4.5 two years ago, right? Uh, something that I, that I need. Um, I, I know that SNAP benefit money has run out. Uh, the child tax credit money has been reduced. Uh, refunds are much lower this year for uh, those who get tax refunds. And and with prices being higher, and, you know, my homeowner's insurance went up. I didn't have a claim. My car insurance went up. I didn't have a claim. You know, all, all these prices are going up. And at some point along the way, when you have less money and the prices keep going up, it, that's got to kick in at some point in the near future. At some point, yep. And it will. That's why I'm on that fence to say, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll probably run into a recession. It's just a matter of how long it will last. Well, I, excuse me. I, then I wonder, because we've got prices going up and we've got a consumer-driven economy, People continue to fuel the economy, spending money that apparently they don't have because the the credit burden is going up uh, across the country. I just isn't this a harbinger for a a year from now, two years from now, a new spate of foreclosures and the kind of hopefully nothing of the the scale that we saw in two thousand eight, but sort of that same template. I don't know. Now I don't know that it's the same template because the the kind of the predatory loans, as they were called that people made that they simply couldn't afford. The, the mortgages that we're looking at, people could afford, and those credit restrictions were a little tighter when they made those loans. And, you know, you look at the majority of people that have home loans right now, the majority are looking at a very, very low rate. So I, I don't know that that would spill over to the uh, to the, to the uh, housing market. Maybe, it, maybe you're correct, and maybe it would, but it's a, it's a different narrative behind it because you had people that couldn't afford those homes from the very beginning. And I would think that the majority of people that are in their homes right now can't afford them. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and say us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Phil, have a great day. You guys do the same. You can catch out to each uh, catch each weekday morning at six thirty eight. Two minute reports from Phil previewing the business day, recapping what happened the day before. We replay those at seven thirty eight as well.